See, when we're in the mindset that there's a, there's a deal between us and God that says, God, you're gonna have grace on me and what I'm gonna do on my end is I'm gonna work really hard for it to show you that I'm worthy. But if that's true, grace isn't a gift at all. Paul writes this letter to the churches in Galatia and he wrote it because they had gotten stuck at making their faith about performing for God holding up their end of the deal. In other words, trying to, trying to prove themselves to God. Now, this hit very close to home for Paul because, see, he was a Pharisee. I mean, you could not get more religious than that. But, but for him, after many years of, of keeping all the rules and practicing his religion religiously, uh, he, was, he was finally freed from all that, and he realized that trying to keep up his end of the deal with God in that way wasn't working. Here's what he writes in chapter 2, verse 19. I tried keeping rules and working my head off to please God, and it didn't work. So I quit trying to meet all its requirements so that I might live for God. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And what Paul's expressing here is that he was working so hard to keep up his end of the deal by keeping all the spiritual rules, but he realized if he was actually going to live for God, if he was going to live with God, something had to change. And so he writes this letter to the Galatians where he's trying to get them to come to the same conclusion that he did. And I want to show you this really, this really powerful imagery that Paul uses. And I hope as we begin to understand it, it will undo some of the spiritual performance that maybe you've gotten used to. See, Paul makes this Old Testament reference in Galatians. And that's a thing that he does a lot throughout the book because, like I said, a lot of the readers were of, of Jew, you know, they had grown up Jewish. So they understood it. They were very familiar with the Old Testament. So when Paul would make even a really subtle reference, like they get it. Like even a little phrase he might say to them, they remembered the whole story that went with that phrase, the whole narrative. So they would hear this one thing and they would remember that episode in their history and they would remember the lesson that came along with that. So you see that a lot that he's doing. And so in chapter three, he's talking about this good news, this, this realization that he has come to, that he wants them to come to, that our end of the deal is not about behavior. Here's what he says in chapter 3, verse 8. God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago when he said, all nations will be blessed through you. Can we say all nations together, the whole thing? All nations will be blessed through you. Okay, that little phrase, we hear it and we're like, great. But when they heard it, they recalled the time when God said this to Abraham. They remembered the whole story that went with this. Abraham was the father of their whole nation, and he had a, a mystical experience with God that is recorded in Genesis 15. And so that whole thing comes to mind for the ancient readers when they first read that. And I'm going to tell you what happened in Genesis 15. I'm going to explain it to you. But first, for you to be able to get that, I have to explain this kind of weird ritual that was very common in Abraham's ancient culture. Um, I need some volunteers for this, but to save time, I just asked some of our creative arts volunteers to come out and be my volunteers for this. Now, they don't know what they're doing. I mean, in their creative arts roles, they're really good. But in this, like, they, they don't know what I've asked them to do. But it's going to be easy. I told them. Okay. So, like I said, there's this really weird thing that um, was an ancient ritual that they used to do. And you know how sometimes when there's a lot of weird things that they did back then, to them it probably didn't seem weird. But we look at it and it definitely feels weird. But I'm going to help you understand it so it's a little less weird. Still weird, though. And then when we hear about a version of this thing that happens in Genesis 15, we'll realize that it is weird, but not as weird because now we get why it's weird or shouldn't be. Are you with me? Okay. So, um, so what happens is that, um, 
they would get uh, some, some animals, okay? They would gather three or four animals. So what we're gonna do is you guys together, you're gonna be one animal. You don't have to, just, you don't have to, just, oh. okay. Uh, um, and just decide what animal you're gonna be. So just talk about, like a, like a cow or a dog or whatever. So just talk amongst yourselves, figure out what animal you're gonna be. You guys are gonna be an animal. You guys are gonna be an animal. You hold on, I'm gonna use you in a minute. Okay, so um, what would happen is they would gather uh, three or four animals to, to kind of do the thing. Now I should tell you, these volunteers are perfectly safe, but I will warn you, this ritual did not go well for the animals. Okay, so just, so you know. Okay, so, uh, okay, what are you guys gonna be? Dog. A dog, okay, what are you guys gonna be? Cow. A cow? Wow. So basically the two examples I gave, didn't I say? <laughs> you guys come up with different animals. No, no cow, no dog, okay. Llama. Okay. Llama, wow, light, okay, Parrot. now what? Parrot. Parrot. Real different, okay. Zebra. Zebra, okay, zebra. <laughs> okay, zebra, parrot, llama, great. Okay, so zebra, you guys come up here. You guys are just gonna stand here. So they'd, they would put the zebra, here, scoot over here. Okay, so they would put, they would have the zebra here, okay, and then parrot, you guys come right behind, llama, you guys come right behind. Okay, so what would happen is the, the, they would cut the animal in half. Okay, that's why I told you it didn't really go well for the animals, but it's fine. Okay, um, so like you're the zebra's head, you're the zebra's, the other end of the, <clears throat> the other end of the zebra. Okay, uh, parrot, the parrot would get cut in half, the llama, sorry llama, got cut in half. Okay, making a, a horrifying aisle in between the two. Okay, and what would happen, now remember that the, this is what would happen when two people were making a, a deal with each other. That's what this was. So the two people will have already agreed on what the deal is gonna be. Here's my part, here's your part. Then they would lay the animals out like this and then here's what would happen. The two people, so Michelle, you're gonna be, we're gonna make this deal together. So what's gonna happen is you're gonna walk through the gross aisle, yep. Okay, and then the second person walks through the aisle. And when they do that, what they're essentially saying, they're making a vow that says, may it be to me as it is with these animals if I do not fulfill my end of the deal. Okay, I should have warned you, you were saying that. but Okay, so they walk through, they're saying, may it be to me, I will hold up my end of the deal. And if I don't, may I be like one of these animal carcass halves, okay? I warned you it was weird. Let's thank our volunteers. Thank you for doing that. Good job, you guys. Okay, so now that you know the context, context, we can go back to Genesis 15, where Abraham and God are in a conversation about the deal between them. And what's happening is that Abraham is kind of, kind of calling God out on not holding up his end of the deal. What God was supposed to do is make Abraham a great nation, but so far that wasn't happening. To be a great nation, you need to have people. Abraham still had no children. And to be a great nation, you had to have land. And every place they went, the land was already occupied. And so he is saying to God that, um, God, you're not holding up your end of the deal. And in Genesis 15, God assures them that he will do what he said. He will still make them a great nation. And still, all nations will be blessed through that nation. That's God's part of the deal. And Abraham's part of the deal is to believe it. That's all Abraham has to do. His part of the deal to fulfill the deal is to believe that God will do his part of the deal. And then they seal this covenant with the ritual that we just talked about. Remember, the ritual says, we both agree on what we're doing. If I don't keep up my end of the deal, I will pay for it. So Abraham goes and he gathers some animals, a cow, a ram, and a goat, and a couple of birds. And here's what happens in verse 12. It says, as the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. And God showed him a vision in his sleep. Okay, so he gathered the animals, but then he falls into a deep sleep. And here is what the vision is that he has. Verse 17. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. So in this vision, 
that Abraham has, he sees a pot with smoke and fire coming out of it that represents God, and it floats through the aisle. Can you picture it? But here's the thing. In the vision, Abraham doesn't walk through. Only God walks through. So God is saying, I will keep up my end of the deal. And if I don't, I will pay. But in this, he is also saying, if you, Abraham, do not keep up your end of the deal, I will pay too. And 2,000 years later, he did. This is the abundant gift of God's grace, the work of Jesus that undoes our need to perform. And this has been God's plan all along, all the way since Abraham, all the way back to the Galatians and to us today. Having God's approval requires nothing other than his grace. And the only thing his grace requires is our belief that we can have it. I mentioned earlier that one of the problems with our performance is that it diminishes our ability to receive something God has for us, and that something is his free, unearned gift of grace. See, when we're in the mindset that there's a, there's a deal between us and God that says, God, you're going to have grace on me, and what I'm going to do on my end is I'm going to work really hard for it to show you that I'm worthy. But if that's true, grace isn't a gift at all. A gift isn't something that you can pay back. It's not a gift if you do that, right? But this is how we do things. Remember, we like things to be even, if you get a birthday gift from somebody, yes, it's a gift, but what are you going to do three months later when it's their birthday? You're going to give them a gift, so it's back to even. If you go out to lunch with someone and they offer to pay, do you just say thank you? No. What do you say? I'll get it next time because we want it to stay even. But with grace, all God asks of us is that we believe it's free. When Paul wrote this part about how he quit working so hard, he goes on to say this in verse 20. So I live in this earthly body by trusting the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. For if keeping the law, or in our case, spiritual performance, could make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. Grace is a gift that we can't pay back. We're not, we're not supposed to pay it back. And every time that we spiritually perform as a way to try to pay it back, what we're actually doing is devaluing Christ's work on the cross. We are choosing not to receive the fullness of the gift of grace. And that's just really hard for us to wrap our minds around. We who like to prove that we can keep up our end of the deal. We who've gotten really good at being really good. And I'm not, I'm not saying to stop doing good things, but until you separate all those good things that you do from having anything to do with God's acceptance of you, then those things are diminishing your experience of grace. If there's any nugget in your mind that the good stuff that you are doing is impressing God or giving you some sort of spiritual credit or, or proving yourself in some way, then you're missing out on grace. But once you allow yourself to, to believe that you can receive grace, that God accepts you, even if you never did another good thing, let that sink in for a second. Once you believe that you can receive grace, and even if you never did another good thing, and I'll raise the ante, even if from that day forward all you did was bad stuff, if you really believed that you still have fully received grace, I think you have just begun to get a glimpse of the depth of the rich, abundant love and grace of God.